the kind of just a brief outline of what our talk is going to look like. Uh, we're going to give you first a quick update on what's happening in the field in terms of pests, um, as well as just growing. Uh, and then we're going to move into flowering and CBD synthesis, and then, and then harvest and the drying and the processing and the markets after that. Okay, so really quick, cannabis is kind of like, you know, the, the slide that always comes up. It's an annual dioecious, dioecious plant, which means you have female and male plants. Um, and we're talking about any cannabis that is 0.3% THC content or below is industrial hemp. We just heard from Brian about the seed and the fiber harvest. And now we're going to be talking again about the CBD hemp production as well as harvest. Okay, so what's happening in the field currently? So what we really want to talk about here are kind of pest management. Uh, so insects. So there's been a variety of insects that have been reported uh, in that throughout the state. Um, two big ones are stalk borers, both the European corn borer and the Eurasian hemp borer, Eurasian bo corn borer. Um, some of the hemp in the corn borers might look similar, as well as the fact that uh, hopefully we don't have too many hemp borers in the state yet because there has not been that much hemp, and so that would be a very quick turnaround for that for that insect. Um, but a lot of farmers are seeing the, the pores in their, in their fields on their plants. Um, you can see there uh, on the left side of the screen, Eurasian hemp or corn borer. Um, and there, we'll talk about ways to mitigate those, but just that those are being seen throughout the, throughout the state. Also a corn earworm uh, is being, is, has been cited throughout the state and then um, particularly in indoor production, there's a, um, aphids, mites, thrips, a lot of thrips I think have been kind of, that's kind of standard for indoor production. Um, and then other insects that are defoliators, so caterpillars, beetles, grasshoppers, um, those are also there. If there is a aphid specifically specific to cannabis, uh, but there's also just kind of um, other aphids that are going to target the plants because they're in the field. So how do we manage these insects? So there's kind of the traditional biopesticide soaps and oils. I think that this has been hit home a couple of times, but there are no labeled chemical pesticides uh, labeled for hemp production. That doesn't matter if it's grain, fiber, or CBD. Uh, so if you're applying a chemical pesticide or insecticide on your hemp, you're wrong. Please stop doing that. Um, th so what what we can what we can do though is monitor visually. Uh, with either visually or with sticky traps, uh, trying to just collect what's in your what's in your fields. Um, if you're seeing plants, excuse me, if you're seeing insects on your plants using either some organic uh, biopesticide, I know no growers have been using BT, and if it is a leaf defoliator and you're gonna get leaf contact, that has been successful in some cases. Um, you can also prune infested parts of the plants. Again, this is gonna be labor intensive, uh, uh, but for something like a, a corn borer, if it's only attacking a small part of the plant, potentially pruning that off and getting rid of that infestation before it spreads can be useful. Um, removing caterpillars by hand and then um, using um, predatory insects can work, especially obviously in, in indoor production where you can release uh, predators uh, has been, especially to really um, tamp down on thrips and aphids. Disease is also uh, something to be scouting for in your fields. So we've mentioned this before, but in the Midwest, we're dealing with significantly more humid conditions that are than from out west, uh, where you know in Colorado and California, where there's large production happening. So uh, there's a couple different big uh, diseases. So powdery mildew and then botrytis, gray mold, um, can be really common in these heavy biomass, especially in the flowering parts once the plants are putting out flowers. So be on the lookout for that. There's some other fusarium, some other, some other molds and diseases that can also attack these plants. And again, ways to prevent or to manage disease. Um, certain ones might respond to oils, potassium bicarbonate, potassium phosphate. Again, these are all gonna be organic methods of fungicide or, or other pesticide. Um, a big way to prevent disease is spacing and ventilation. So really making sure you're getting airflow through your fields, through your plants, so you don't have a lot of moisture sitting uh, on the plants throughout the day and throughout the season. And then if you're irrigating, drip irrigation is gonna vastly reduce splash. Uh, obviously you're, drip, you're dripping water uh, either on the soil surface or even subsoil surface. Uh, 
And so you're not gonna have splash from, from irrigation as well as um, if you have bare soil, you know, reducing bare soil. So if you're using a cover, um, that's also gonna reduce, re either plastic or living is gonna reduce uh, splash and potentially disease. Last pest is vertebrates. Um, we have here deer, deer, rabbits, mice, moles, and humans. We don't want to leave out humans. Um, a couple years ago when I was growing in Indiana, we lost a crop because some teenagers thought it was, well, I don't know if they thought it was something else, but they can take out your, take out your field. So um, fences, barriers, signs can be really useful, um, depending on if someone wants to read it or not. Um, but we also lost, as I mentioned earlier, at Michael Fields, we lost a crop to, or part of a crop to ground squirrel. Um, and the way we solved that was actually by using, for, in, for what vegetable producers use is low cover, um, and just basically covered up those plants for two weeks until they got stocky enough to fight off um, the rodents. Key points, so, excuse me, protection strategies. So it's, it's scouting, it's using other cultural practices, um, plant spacing, pest, when I say pesticides, again, we're referring to non-synthetic pesticides, biological control like predatory, and then sanitation. So just trying to prevent the disease from being even on the premises, removing contaminated plants, whether that's insects, whether that's disease. Um, so just really quick key points. I'm, I'm going through this quickly because I want to make sure we are also are going to talk about predominantly about harvest. Uh, so again, scouting regularly um, and identify, identifying what the pest is. Um, that can really be helpful in terms of determining what would be the best solution to that pest, whether it's an insect, whether it's a disease, and, and which one, obviously. Um, and then what's happening spatially, te temporally, you know, in terms of spacing, in terms of when this is happening, where is your plant at its growth stage? Uh, that can be really important. If it's in a certain growth point, maybe that's it's a nutrition deficiency versus uh, a disease. Um, and then selecting the appropriate protection strategies makes sense. Um, and, and detailing your records, uh, what you're seeing when, um, and then using the resource that you have at your availability, whether that's state entomologist, pathologist, whether that's any of the folks here at this presentation. Um, but just if you're having problems trying to find those who have the answers can be really useful. Uh, speaking of who have the answers, these are additional resources, and you'll see that first link there um, is from Colorado State. Uh, Whitney um, Grinchel, thank you. She Grinchel, she has an incredible website for all insects on hemp, uh, and it's a really great resource. I use her all the time. Um, our Colleague Rodrigo Worley has put together um, a document on pesticides and what can be used. Excuse me, what can, for in terms of what's been used and sprayed and when you can re-entry in for hemp, uh, as well as some other some other UW resources. So I, I encourage everybody to check those out. So uh, we're going to now talk about the actual the flowering and what we're trying to what, what what where are we going? So the flowering. So. If we're, in this, we're talking about CBD. So what is um, CBD? So it's a cannabinoid. Um, and so the cannabis plant creates eight major cannabinoid acids. And so this is, okay, this is just one of a suite of different chemicals that cannabis produces. Uh, there's a, can be over 80 different terpene structures in the plant as well. And so this is just one of the major chemicals that the plant produces. Uh, it's traditionally in CBDA which refers to the acid, it's uh, cannab cannabidolic acid, um, as well as um, THCA is another compound that the, the plant produces, uh, which is referring to THC. So what happens is THCA and CBDA, we're gonna focus on CBDA because we're not concerned about the THC content in terms of product, well, we're concerned about it being below 0.3%, otherwise we, we're not concerned about it. Um, so in the process of heat, which decarboxylates that acid and turns it into what we just referred to as CBD, which is the cannabinoid oil. And where does it come from? So CBD is produced in the trichome structures on the female flower. And so these trichomes are glandular hairs and they are all along the surface of the female flower. And at the, at the tip of that glandular hair, that polyp is where, it, where the CBD is being secreted. And trichomes are, again, are, are producing other, other chemicals as well in terms of 
terpenes, flavonoids, et cetera. And that's gonna, when we talk about flavor uh, of a smokable CBD or particularly the aroma when you're in the fields, I'm sure if you guys have been in CBD fields, you're able to smell the plants. Um, and that's what's all emanating and um, out of these trichome structures on the female flower. So we wanna harvest that female flower. So there's a couple different ways we can do that. So the first big thing is that there's some visual clues on the hemp bud or the hemp flower. Those trichomes kind of shift from a clearish white to this milky white. Um, and that's, you, that if you have a large budding structure, you, you should be able to see that color turn. It's, it is pretty significant, but it's also gonna depend on when you put your plants in the ground, the, the, the um, the day length, the climate, as well as the cultivar, um, and, and how quickly they mature. So uh, depending on all of those factors, we're looking at approximately um, in this state, mid-September to mid-October for your, for your harvest. And again, that can stretch um, even within a field over time. So, and there's different parts that can be harvested. It can be the entire plant as biomass. You just cut it at the stalk and, and, take, and um, Take it out of the field or you can harvest the flowers individually themselves leaving the plants in the field um, and then you can also harvest trim flower which is uh, either in the field trimming or, uh, or removing branches and flowers and trimming out off of the field importantly i know hopefully you were with us earlier uh, when melody was speaking but you need to contact that cat 30 days before you're harvesting so they can come out and test your plants so the labor of harvest uh, is intense and I really want to drive this home because the harvest end is where we can see some, um, even if you're able to successfully grow a crop, you can kind of lose it all in the harvest drying processing process. So it's traditionally done by hand labor, cutting at the base uh, and hauling those plants out of the field. This is going to take a lot of time and physical exertion. Uh, some, you know, hopefully if you've grown successful plants, they're these big bushy plants that uh, are going to be difficult. It just is going to take time and effort. Um, as I said, you can grow it well, but if you have inadequate labor or time to get those plants out of the field when they need to be taken out, you can really drastically reduce your CBD content or uh, just um, damage the plants. Um, and so it's important to just to kind of keep track of the hours that are being spent. Um, and, and kind of <laughs> similar to the combine, if we, if we think about the human as the combine, it's important to keep uh, knife sharp, that'll really be helpful uh, in the harvesting process and it actually will cut down on time significantly. Um, I had a dull knife uh, in my field the other day when I was removing males and I was whacking at the plants for a very long time and you know I wasn't taking my own advice. So just something to keep in, keep in consideration. This is mostly on hand labor, so there's also machinery that can be used in harvest. Um, so when, when we've done the hand harvesting, uh, there's debutters or buckers, which you can see in the top right hand of the screen. And what that basically is, is it's a, uh, you feed a stem through a plate that is sized uh, for your stem and it rips off all the leaves and the buds of the plant collecting that material. And so you've essentially stripped the stalk, you can remove the, leave the stalk and then you have your biomass to dry down. Um, I put at the bottom here, Hemp Harvest Works, uh, it's a website. And they have an, a, an array of hemp harvesting machinery uh, for CBD particularly. Um, there's obviously combines and um, et cetera for grain and fiber, which Brian has talked about, uh, but there's also pretty heavy machinery for CBD. I have some pictures here. Um, so if we're talking about, you know, if you're not gonna personally hand cut and haul plants out of the field, there's actually implements you can attach the back of the tractor and uh, as you can see, you put it up on the three point hitch there and then it clips and then uh, conveyor belts the plants up uh, to a wa somebody in a wagon and then they're gonna collect uh, and lay the plants out. And I had a question of would this damage the plants? Um, and I have never used this machine personally, um, but it, as you can see, it's actually just gonna hold that plant upright. So it really should, there, there should be potentially even less damage than if you're carrying it out of the field when you're dropping it or, you know, um, smashing it against other plants. So once you've harvested all of your plants and they're out of the field, the next, the next start is, uh, the, sorry, the next step is drying. And this isn't a really important step. Uh, similar to, to Brian talking about the grain, where you have four to six hours to get that grain kind of out of the field and into a drying bin, uh, it's otherwise you could potentially lose a lot of your grain. Similarly, 
not the same time window, but it's very important to dry your hemp properly, CBD hemp properly, um, as quickly as possible, um, with as little damage to the plant uh, as possible as well, will really help keep a high con quality and content of CBD, whereas vice versa, if it's uh, not done, if it's if there's too much moisture, it's done slowly, um, not enough ventilation, you can really get uh, a lot of mold quite quickly um, and that'll spoil your CBD um, and pretty much make it unsellable. So uh, when we're drying CBD hemp, it's often being done in large ventilated barns or drying chambers. So something that's often, though it's under a roof, it's out of direct sunlight. Um, Kind of popular are tobacco drying units. So there were there were a lot of tobacco drying sheds in parts of the state. Uh, those can be used uh, to dry hemp in or old barns. It is it depending on the quality of product. If you have a facility that is suitable production of food and medical product, that would be ideal. So that's going to be clean, dry floors. If they're cemented, that's even better. Um, but wherever you're drying, they need to be out of contact with any insect or animal infestation. If you're in an old barn, you do not want birds and swallows uh, flying in and out of that and, and potentially contaminating your crop. Uh, that, that's, that, it's important to make sure that that's not happening. So in these drying facilities, you're hanging your plants, whether that's a trellis, by chain, or other structure. Uh, and the idea is to get as much ventilation in there as possible. So using either fans, if it's air conditioned, if um, you have other ways of getting air into those drying spaces, that's ideal. Like the grain, we're not trying to use heat to dry down our crop, we're trying to use airflow. So it's important to think about density uh, when you're thinking about your ventilation, uh, as well as your humidity control. So as I mentioned, uh, we're not using heat to dry things down. So actually a cooler temperature between 60 and 70 degrees uh, with approximately 60% humidity is considered ideal uh, climates for drying CBD down. There are hemp drying machines, um, especially if you're at a really large scale, it kind of does the whole thing. You put the plant in there and it, and it, it dries it down for you. Um, they can use warm, dry air to speed up that drying process, but you need to be quite careful about that because excessive heat will degrade your CBD uh, and as well as other structures, terpenes, flavonoids. Um, and again, I've heard different, different uh, temperatures, but uh, I've heard not over 110. So between one, 110 or 20, similar to your grain. But just, again, I'm gonna reiterate, trying to not use heat, but to use air to uh, dry, the, dry your plants down. Um, and kind of the way one does it is it's you're either uh, you're drying whole plants or trimmed branches and you're hanging them upside down. Uh, some people will remove stems uh, prior to hanging um, or hang and then trim as they go. Um, and you can trim to whatever extent you want. Um, and that's going to depend t partially on what, who your processor is. So some processors want all biomass um, and, and they'll either extract it whole or, um, or separate it themselves. Some are looking just for flower um, or somewhere in between. So maybe you don't have the fan leaves, but you can have whole branches. And so this is just kind of some pictures of what, a f what drying uh, production looks like. The bit larger on your left might be a bit more standard um, for farmers in this state who don't necessarily have the facilities currently like built to dry CBD. You have an old barn uh, and you've got it hanging in, hanging in there. Um, this is a whole plant, and so something one wants to be careful about is this umbrella shape. And so if you hang the plant upside down, it's going to collapse in on itself. Uh, and it can be difficult to get airflow in between those branches, and you can kind of mold from the inside out. So something to take into consideration, you can see on the bottom right, you also have the whole plant kind of doing this closed umbrella shape. Um, and that's just something to be considered about. But there looks good spacing, good ventilation. It's also a very clean barn, cemented floor. Um, and then up in the right hand, you see just the branches there, and that's much more of a lab type, type procedure. It can be difficult to estimate the square footage needed. You know, one, one question we're getting is, well, okay, I have this many plants, et cetera, what do I need to dry it? Um, and that's gonna depend on the, the phenotype, what the plants look like per cultivar, as well as your climate, how dry it is, um, how, what the temperature is like. Some examples out of North Carolina that I have heard is that um, one grower was able to grow, excuse me, dry about 
1,400 plants in an 800 square foot barn in three days. Uh, I don't know if they, what, what kind of fan they had or um, how tall, how tall those rafters were. But, an, uh, but um, another example was that basically an, a, a second grower could do approximately maybe, a, they didn't say how many plants, but let's say it was about 14,000 again per acre excuse me, 1,400 per acre, um, they could do that in roughly twice this amount of space. And so, excuse me, uh, two, three times the amount of space. And so it, just, it, it depends on what you have on, on hands. Um, but really at the end, you wanna want product like this. On the left, you have just biomass, which is leaf, flower structure, et cetera, in a, in a, in a sack. Um, and that's gonna be transported in one of those large white sacks. And then on the right, you have actual flowers. Um, and that's your dried product. And that looks like it could either be smokable flour or it's gonna go a long, long way to processing and, uh, and processing and testing. And that is where Shelby is gonna take over. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Leah, for introducing the in-field considerations for harvesting your CBD plants. So. Now I'm going to, we have a, a dried product, what comes next? So um, first thing is probably going to be doing some cannabinoid testing. So before you harvest, DACAP is gonna come out and test for THC. That's their major concern. Is it below that 0.3% THC? Now the processor that you're selling your product to is going to be concerned again about THC, but now that CBD percentage. So how, um, how are they going to test for that? So again, um, most cannabinoid testing is using a piece of equipment um, and a technique called high performance liquid chromatography. So typically you'll have your dried cannabis biomass or flour and it'll be ground and then mixed with the solvent that extracts the cannabinoids from that product. And then that solvent is pumped through a column. And depending on the chemical makeup of uh, each cannabinoid, it will traverse that column at a different rate. So if it's more attracted to the column, it takes a slower amount of time to get through. If it's not attracted to the column, it goes through fast. Uh, so then at the end, when it, it uh, leaves the column, it's uh, detected by the HPLC detector, which will then quantify the amount of that material and that is uh, later what you'll use to um, quantify each individual cannabinoid. So an example of what that will look like is here. So kind of at the bottom, that is time. So that's the amount of time each chemical takes to, uh, to, to exit the column. So the first chemical here, uh, CBDV, that's gonna be the thing that came off fast. It wasn't attracted to the column, it's detected. And then the very last, um, molecule that's coming out is the THCA. So that one was most attracted to the packing material in the column. So you're going to run um, all of the cannabinoids that you're interested in testing for. You'll run those or know, have known standards to see where those peaks should occur at which time. And those known standards will be a known concentration. So then you can calculate the area under the curve of each of these peaks to get the concentration of all of your cannabinoids. Here you see there are 11 different cannabinoids being tested. So there's the uh, Delta 9 THC and the THCA, um, as well as lots of other cannabinoids, specifically CBD. Um, so remember that DACAP calculates total THC as a combination. So the total THC um, using this acidic version or the D, um, the, the acidic version times this factor. So you get your concentrations and then you'll get a report from either the processor or the company the processor is using to test for cannabinoids. Um, so that will be your certificate of analysis. And contrary to what might be coming from DACAP that will only have maybe the THC, this will have all of your cannabinoids and it'll tell you the percentage of each of those. Um, and this is pretty much going to be what you're going to use to negotiate with your processor when you say, okay, I have, my product is 11% CBD and you'll negotiate your price based on this as well as when they um, move forward. 
There are other things that you can test for besides cannabinoids. Um, some bad things, some good things. So uh, a lot of people do a heavy metal analysis. Um, so you want to make sure that you don't have high concentrations of things like lead, arsenic, mercury. Um, you also want to test for pesticide contamination. Um, that's particularly important because, uh, because hemp or cannabis in general is known to uh, accumulate a lot of um, or be a bioaccumulator. The flower itself will concentrate a lot of these toxic compounds. So you want to make sure if it's going to be used for human consumption that you don't have an excess uh, amount of that particular compound if it's a heavy metal or a pesticide. There's also the terpenes. Here you have a report of what a terpene analysis might look like. So you can see the percentage of all of these compounds run through um, gas gas. <laughs> Chromatography. Chromatography <laughs> mess, that GCMS. Um, and so that's that's a favorable thing you're trying to market based on what um, particular terpenes you might have that are affecting the flavor or aroma, it might be more important for a smokeable, uh, smokeable flower market. And then finally, you can test for specific microbes, as uh, Brian talked about earlier in his uh, presentation. So all right, now you have all of your reports. Um, so each processor is going to test for various things. Um, they will probably all test for cannabinoids because that's probably what you're going to agree on in your contract. So moving forward, um, you ship your, far, your biomass or flower to your processor. So now we're going to extract those cannabinoids from the material. And so the first step is to extract kind of a crude um, uh, oil from the biomass, and then you can further go on to purify that into a distillate or an isolate. And those will be then sold or processed into downstream products. So there are several different ways to extract uh, CBD. A very common method is to use supercritical CO2, which uses controlled pressure and heat and carbon dioxide, and um, it produces a very clean product. However, the equipment, the startup equipment is very expensive and the operational learning curve is very steep. So um, you need to really know what you're doing to get into the super and subcritical CO2 extractions. Um, a much easier entry point are the ethy ethanol and butane extractions. So you can use high grade um, grain, uh, food grade grain el ethanol alcohol <laughs> to extract the cannabinoids. However, it's a little bit of a more rough and tumble methodology than the uh, CO2 extraction. You might destroy some of the other beneficial compounds that are in um, that uh, extract, that crude oil. Um, butane is a commonly used extraction uh, protocol. There's a relatively low equipment cost and operational cost, but it's quite flammable, so it's considered quite dangerous. However, some people say this produces um, flavorful extracts that are not achieved when you do the CO2 extractions. And finally, you can use oils such as olive oil. However, oils are perishable. So when you do this, they have a, long, a shorter shelf life and should be stored in a cooler and darker place. Um, so after your initial extraction, you're going to have what's called a full spectrum oil. And that full spectrum oil is going to contain a wide range of cannabinoids. So it's going to uh, have your CBD, but also some of the other cannabinoids such as CBN and CBL. It's going to have um, some of these beneficial compounds like the terpenes, which are providing these different aromas and flavors. It's also going to have whatever small amount of THC would have been in that product when it was processed. Um, because you're not removing any of the cannabinoids at that point. Uh, a lot of people like the full spectrum oils because there is some preliminary research and some uh, word of mouth research <laughs> saying that the cannabinoids uh, work better in concert and that this is known as the entourage effect. So if you have all of these cannabinoids, then you might be getting more of a benefit. Um, just touching on, so after you have your full spectrum, you can further uh, clean that product. And that can either be by removing some of the waxes and lipids, um, further filter, filtering and removing additional solvent, 
and then distilling to get um, certain fractions of the cannabinoids and isolation being just isolating a specific cannabinoid. So um, the most common things that you'll hear are CBD distillate, which is when you further process that crude extract. Um, this typically contains approximately 80% CBD, as well as some of the other cannabinoids and terpenes, but to a lesser extent. Um, and this is frequently referred to as a broad spectrum, not a full spectrum, but it's, uh, it's a little bit more pure, a little bit less of the, all that other stuff, but still has some of it in there. Now this is different from the CBD isolate, which is actually purified cannabidiol. So it's just um, a white granular crystal that's it's virtually pure CBD. So you can see in this image here what you might picture if you had a crude product, a distillate, and an isolate. And those products are going to be used for um, are those particular um, extractions are going to be used for different markets. So, you know, if you're doing tinctures um, or lotions, you might be using more of a crude distillate. An isolate is going to be very useful if you want to know the exact concentration of CBD in something, or if you want to adjust the concentration of a different product, it's more of like a pure chemical that you can use to do that. All right, so now you have your product. So what are the some of the processing agreements you might negotiate <laughs> with the processors? Um, so these are all being figured out right now. <laughs> They're changing every day because the supply and demand is changing every day. The number of processors, number of growers is changing. So you can just be a grower and have biomass or flowers that you would sell to the processor. You negotiate a price per pound based on the CBD concentration and they buy it. And then the process, it's the processors, they use it and make their products. You can also pay a processor to extract it for you, in which case they would give you back the extracted CBD, either full spectrum, distillate, isolate. Um, or you can do what is called a split contract where you might you know, give a certain poundage of product and then the processor would extract all of it and keep half of the, uh, the crude and give you back the other half. So these are all different negotiations. There's also people that are starting to talk about futures. So that's, that's in the future, but you know, where um, agreements are already being, being made for the 2020 year that people, processors will buy something for a certain price and that's agreed upon now, uh, no matter what happens in the future. Um, so what are the current, what's the market like right now in August of 2019 in Wisconsin? Uh, <laughs> unknown. So <laughs> um, what we do know is that in 2015 that U.S. hemp-based product sales were $573 million and that last year that number was $1.1 billion. So in, in those three years or four years, um, that number doubled. So the projections for this year while we still don't know, some people predict that that number might even double between 2018 and 2019 this year. Um, people are just making projections on what's going on, but really um, Melody touched on something that's not known. A lot of these projections are based on total acreage of um, the amount of licensed acreage, but that is not indicative of how much is going to come out of the fields this year. So that number is going to be very dependent on what happens in the next month when people are harvesting. Um, so these products include food-based products, industrial applications, fiber products, and of course, CBD. So here's um, a projection of where the market will be in 2022. So you can see all the different uh, potential categories with hemp thrive CBD as being um, still the front runner for um, sales generation. So this project projection is 1.9 billion. Um, a lot of other projections say so maybe it'll be higher than that, but we'll see. Um, and then there's industrial applications. And again, that's going to be the thing that's missing right now for a lot of hemp-based products is the infrastructure for processing. So things like fiber, you know, there are not enough 
uh, facilities around the country to process the fiber, so we can't do it. But as those facilities are built and the infrastructure is formed, then we're going to see an uptick in all of these other categories. Um, so as mentioned, the prices are going to vary with market. The markets are changing every day. So what we do know is some of the data from last year that we collected. So kind of an example of um, one end to the other end of what you might get for your product is, um, say you just had wet, so non-dried biomass out of the field. Um, you might expect to receive something like three to 365 uh, per pound per CBD percentage, which then you'd be looking at um, around $20,000 per acre. Um, however, if you had very nicely trimmed floral material that had high percent uh, CBD, so this example being 10% CBD with 1,000 pounds coming out of a acre, getting $7 at that price point, that would be upwards of $70,000 an acre. Um, that's the highest, I think, that <laughs> you will see. Now, if you had less percentage um, of CBD, maybe 5%, maybe it was biomass that you were looking at instead of flour, you would get something closer to $10,000 out of the acre. So you can see there's a, dra there's a very, very wide range. Processes are giving different money, amounts of money. Um, there's no industry standard right now. Uh, so we, well, I'll talk about this later, but um, we're working very hard to collect data from all of the growers in the state to see what they're getting so we can put these reports out that are as accurate as can be um, in the 2019 growing season. So one thing we know for sure is there are an increase in growers and that there will be substantially more CBD on the market in 2019. Um, just different examples from different states. Kentucky, um, an increase of 162% of registered acres. Um, same thing from 2017 to now in Colorado, an increase of 562% in Oregon, 1,300% 1, <laughs> increase in outdoor acreage. So, I mean, that's happening countrywide. Uh, a lot of people are growing a lot more hemp <laughs> in 2019. Um, we know that there's a 7x increase in licenses than in 2018 in Wisconsin. Again, that's projected acreage, we'll see what is actually grown. If these numbers are accurate, um, there'll probably be a saturation in the market and you'll see a price drop, but we don't know what that will be. And also the federal regulations and the FDA rulings on what CBD will be able to be, how CBD will be able to be integrated into food products and pet food and all of these things, that FDA decision will drastically increase uh, alter the marketability of CBD products this fall as well. So what what can you do? <laughs> you grew hemp, what can you do with it? Um, or for the future, just grow the best crop that you can possibly grow, right? So um, you want to keep all the weeds out of your fields, you want to scout for your pests early, control them as early as you can, you want to um, grow varieties that are at the highest percentage CBD, that's all hard this year, but hopefully in the coming years, um, as we have more data, we'll know what works well in Wisconsin. Negotiate your contracts with your processors as early as possible. So if you don't have a contract right now, um, make sure you're figuring out what your next year's contract is going to be. So there's going to be more processors and there's more processors every day that are popping up. So. Um, Finding those connections between growers and processors, that's been very challenging this year. At the UW Hemp website, we are trying very hard um, to, to bridge that connection. And potentially after the federal regulations, um, the licenses and, and the state regulations, those licenses might be publicly available so processors can find growers and whatnot, or ha at least next year have an option to opt into making your information publicly avail available, but negotiation is important. Um, and then the other option is, if you have a way to store your product for a longer term, then potentially sitting on the product for a little bit until you know some of this fall season uh, biomass is eaten up into the early uh, 2020, if you can sell it then, you might find a better uh, price point than if you're selling it in October. 
Um, so the Tennessee has um, a few really nice extension bulletins where they captured data um, in 2018 of what the average price points were for a lot of different types of materials. So I encourage you to look at those publications um, for what may, might be a good representation of what would be in Wisconsin. And we also have ongoing right now um, the University of Wisconsin River Falls as well as the University of Madison Rank Agribusiness Institute are conducting this market survey that you were uh, probably sent if you had a hemp growing license this year. Um, this is the link to the survey. It should be up for another one to two weeks. The more information you can tell us, the more accurate our um, analysis will be when we make that publicly available. So please fill out that survey. Um, and then finally, uh, I wanted to just touch on a few of the upcoming events. These were mentioned earlier, but if you're listening to this, um, you just joined recently. So there's going to be a grain and fiber field day um, taking place at the Arlington Research Station on August 28th. There will be a specific section yeah, on hemp starting at 1 p.m. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the CBD research that's happening um, at that tour or at that field day. Um, you can find out more at this link here. And then there's two upcoming CBD field days There'll be one on September 6th in the morning at the Michael Fields Egg Institute. You can register using this link. And then the um, September 13th field day, which will take place at West Star Organics, that's um, co-hosted by West Star, Circadian Organics, um, UW Horticulture, and Michael Fields. So that's gonna be um, a good one to attend. Lots of um, people, hopefully from all the different spheres of growers and processors and re retail, so potentially good opportunities for networking there and finding um, processors if you're looking for them. And yeah, so with that, that's our um, the end of our presentation for our CBD um, harvest considerations and processing. So um, my email and Leah's email are listed there as well as again, the um, UW hemp website where you can find all the things that we're working on, upcoming events, as well as all of these webinars will be recorded and posted there. There's a lot of upcoming events in the next two months that we're going to constantly be adding to the calendar. So keep an eye on that. And I think now we're going to take questions. Yeah, we have some uh, questions. I'm going to be the moderator again since I can see the, uh, see the screen and uh, questions that are coming in from the live audience. Um, so, uh, I'm going to let it scroll up. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, do the, do agronomists have any recommendations for moisture meters? Uh, we can use grain moisture, um, but are there special, specialized flower moistures for CBD hemp? I do not know the answer to that. Um, I've, I do not test by moisture. I usually have done it by sites. Do you know if there's moisture, um, specialized moisture? talk that that question came in. Yeah, that yeah. came in. I would, yeah. So there are uh, specific to CBD, I don't know, I'm not aware of any moisture meter for CBD. Uh, there is a, a moisture meter specific for grain, uh, but it's, it is manufactured in Canada. Um, for the life of me, I can't remember the name now. Uh, there is a moisture meeting meter for hemp grain uh, that's being used for official grain purposes up in Canada. Um, the one thought I had about CBD was possibly uh, they have these hay test moisture meters. So something like that's possible. Um, I've heard anecdotally that if the CBD crop is dry, if you're able to snap yeah. the branches uh, as opposed to just letting them bend, that would be an indication that it's dry. Yeah, yeah. You're looking for, an, I think, 8 to 10% moisture content, content is ideal, and that is a test that's frequently used. You're kind of... Any any branch that's kind of larger than pinky size, if you can readily snap, is indicative it's dry enough. Um, okay, next question. Uh, we have a lot of kids help us on the farm with hay, rock picking, et cetera. Do workers have to be eight, 18 years of age to handle hemp? No, there is no requirement for um, age limits on handling hemp. Um, okay. Uh, 
let's see here. We have a long one um, from Liz. So I'm coming, thinking it's coming out of Brown County. Um, what is to be done for state testing hemp compliant plant strains kept in a vegetative state? So I think this is referring back to our conversation actually before the webinar started. It's that um, ones that are kept as mother plants and used only for vegetative cloning, um, it's not best practice love to let them flower, um, can cause hermaphroditism and future genetics. Yes, all of this makes sense. Um, so what is the state's position on how to test or establish regu regulation on a hemp compliant strains that are allowed to flower a finished crop? Uh, would the state of Wisconsin prefer licensed hemp growers to manage slash document the introduction of the entire completed crop female hemp plants back into the vegetative growing stage and then flowering and creating a second crop 10 to 12 weeks later, 10 to 12 weeks later um, at the same plants be tested twice within the second crop to date? So I think it's just to talk a bit okay. more about the mother plants. Um, so um, we do need to test the mother plants, but we don't need to test all the mother plants. So you could keep some in the vegetative state. We need some to go uh, to more maturity so that we can actually give them an adequate THC test. And then um, the clones that are coming from that same crop can be used for planting, can be sold, can be moved. It all kind of goes back to if you want to move um, crop from the property, it has to be tested. And we recognize that people want to grow clones and they want to sell them and they need to keep things in a vegetative state in order to do that. If you can take like some subset of those plants and have those go to maturity, we can test those as the representative of the crop and then we can give you you know, that fit for commerce certificate that then you can use for those clones. Follow up that to that is, can we sell seedlings to other licensed growers who may not have a space to start seeds? Yes, you can grow seedlings to other licensed growers. And uh, we like to see that represented on the, um, like on your planting form. And there's a, there's a transfer column where you're you may transfer plants in, you might be purchasing seedlings, or you're transferring plants out where you're selling seedlings. Okay. Um, we answered those top two ones, Tony. Um, can I sell hemp flowers such as pre-rolls? Uh, once uh, a crop has been tested, um, you can do whatever you want with that crop. And so, yes, that would be correct. Okay. Um, wondering if we will have clear legislation to protect us from the fact that T HCA degrades into THC over time? Uh, I'm not sure exactly where that question is going. Yeah. Um, I think that um, the, yeah, the THC content can be kind of a moving target. And so um, you want to have a good test result for your crop and then and move it off to processing. And so um, you know, I don't know that there's a hundred percent guarantee. I, I'm not sure that I'm really answering your question adequately. Um, we'll, we'll let that go. Yeah. So this one's about okay. bioaccumulation. It says, what measures is that cap taking to protect consumers from res residual toxins remaining in soils? Um, what notice is, what notice is being given to producers about risks of tainting batches during processing? And how will a consumer in Wisconsin buying a Wisconsin-made product know of their dangerous toxins in their product? Um, I also, I, yeah, I'm happy for you to answer that if you want. Or, there's, that's not something that is up to the purview of Department of Ag. No, we don't. Uh, we don't do that kind of testing. That testing would be done downstream right. somewhere from from growing. And that's one of the issues, or not issues, but one of the potential issues in this whole industry is mm -hmm. that those regulatory procedures are not in place and that it's right. um, a lot of these processors, et cetera, are not being tested. Um, and so you need to be pretty conscious as a consumer about where you're getting your product from. Mm -hmm. After a crop has been inspected by DACAP, and issued fit for a crop certificate, can growers bring their harvest to an off-farm driving facility for drying? Yes. 
Yes, okay. once you get the fit for commerce certificate, you can move it to wherever you want to move it to. Sure. Um, has cannabis aphid been discovered in Wisconsin yet? That I don't know. I have not heard of cases, I believe, of cannabis aphid, just of aphid in general. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there preemptive sprays that growers can use for prevent mildews and molds? Do you know what I mean? Oh, I, don't, I, don't have, no, I wouldn't have an answer for that. Yeah. We, unknown on that. David Smith will be there and you'll provide some discussions sure. and applaud tours, but that's as far as I'll. Yeah. And, and actually the next question is about that too. Is there a list of any oils that can be used to remove pests? Um, any preventive measures before? So I will say that there are lists of acceptable oils and sprays um, on the, it's through, um, through the federal regulation, but that list is up on the Wisconsin hemp website and the DAT cap available, hemp, available right. at the DAT cap website yeah. as well. Um, and that will list out which, what each um, oil is, what it is and what it's used for. Yeah, oils and soaps. Um, and also a lot of recommendations say once your plant begins to flower, you no longer want to use those. So some of the late maturing or the late season molds that you're gonna see, it becomes more difficult and more of a um, cultural practice of keeping airflow and removing that part of the plant that's been contaminated because once that flower is there, you, you want to put minimal stuff on your plant. Can growers stagger their harvest over several days or even weeks once it has been inspected and approved for harvest? Well, um, if you're gonna have very different harvesting times, you might want to have multiple testing times because the THC content continues to go up. And, you know, so let's say we come out and we test and you're good to go um, and you harvest some early, that is gonna also probably be good as the THC content continues to go up. Some of the later harvest might get past that 0.3% THC and you might lose out somewhere in uh, selling it to a processor. If they have it tested, they might not buy it because of the THC content being too high. Is there a risk of flowers falling off during harvest? I have never, yeah. I've never heard of that. It's pretty much on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I would say there is a small risk of if you have too dry of plants and they dry quickly that those trichomes can break off and become brittle, in which case you will lose your cannabinoids. Um, so that might be more of a consideration is drying too fast and having those trichomes fall off your flowers. Do you have resources for planning or building adequate drying chambers or sheds for smaller scale farmers growing on only a couple hundred plants? That's I think, you know, kind of your general shed building hoop houses, some people are using like um, bare hoop houses, high tunnels. Um, yeah, and, and there are people building large drying facilities for lease. Um, so those will be available if they're not already, but finding those connections is, is kind of the thing right now that's the hurdle. Um, what is a good, oh, what is a good method to fix nutrient lockout with plants outdoors in a field? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, um, if you could, do yeah. you, do you know what the, that so means? So like nutrient lockout a lot of the time is occurring because your soil is too wet. So not growing in clay soils and making sure that your soil is well aerated is probably the, the thing that you're gonna do. And also making sure that your roots aren't bound um, when they're planted. Um, but yeah, high, high clay soils, very, very high organic soils. I mean, that's going to cause the most nutrient lockout. So aerated, loamy, sandy soils. Yeah. Um, okay, we got a couple of those. Um, what is the latest time of year CBD hemp can be harvested? That's going to depend on its developmental stages, its dryness, and then obviously if you have sent in your paperwork to that cap in an appropriate, timely manner. And snow. And snow, right, also <laughs> frost, I'm about to say. I mean, uh, that's your cutoff window is when you're, when you're hitting frost, um, but, but for that, that, those are the other indications. 
Um, any suggestions for a consultant to help on indoor greenhouse operation, uh, standard operating procedures? Um, I will, I'm not doing indoor production myself. Um, but the, the UW website, yeah, again, is a people, good link. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a good, it's a good link um, without promoting, without us specifically promoting any yeah. specific one, I would like to say, yeah, go to that. Um, does the greenhouse need to have a growing permit to grow from seed till transplanting into the uh, yeah, well, you need, yes, you need a grower uh, license and you need that uh, location registered. Um, so you need to, we need to have those coordinates for that. So if you are growing, if you plant, you need to have those locations registered. Okay. Uh, we heard that processors have the ability to dilute the THC percentage. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Yeah, with those isolates, um, you can begin to make whatever concentrations you so desire. If we have to cull plants before harvest or prune leaves, can we compost this on site, feed to chickens? Or are there other ways to destroy and dispose of the plants? Um, I will say that there is, uh, if you're pulling male plants, um, that there are instances of, especially depending on how late you're pulling that male plant, there could actually still be mature pollen in that sack, even if it's not been released. So I do not recommend mm -hmm. dumping that plant close to or or composting it close to your to your fields. Um, in terms of feeding to animals, I know you, the grain is not uh, legal to feed to to animals. Um, I'm not sure about composting and feeding. I mean, I'm not sure. If you're going to be feeding the chickens, it's probably going to be grain. Um, I don't, so. Right, even, um, you know, we were talking about remediation earlier, even if you were trying to use like hemp that you um, couldn't sell as animal bedding, that's not even allowed yet because the animals might eat it. So um, right. for now you just kind of have to keep everything away from the animals. So maybe composting and returning it to the soil would be acceptable. Sure. Um, and then finally, is there somewhere to uh, not finally? Is there somewhere to send plant material for petiole testing? And if so, do they have recommendations for nutrient levels? Um, again, I would say the Wisconsin Hemp website has all those lists of different people, and I, I know of several different labs that are doing that, and they are on that website. Uh, if you have a plot that is covered side by side by multiple hoop houses for early flower. AK light deprivation with the same strain, can this be tested with one test? I assume this is talking about dat cap testing. Okay, say this again. If you have a plot that is covered by multiple hoop houses, oh, so it's not, it's more than more than uh, if they one are field. if they're separated, if they're separate, like distinct greenhouses, distinct hoop houses, those are separate um, testing locations. Okay. Um, thank you to everyone uh, who has tuned in today, um, especially thank you to uh, my colleagues beside me who's taken their time and, and a lot of information and Liz up in Brown County. Again, check out um, all of the links and websites that will be on these presentations, which will be available uh, within a couple of weeks once uh, Tony, also thank you Tony for running this webinar. He's done a wonderful job and he will be editing and uh, putting these recordings up on that Wisconsin Hemp website. So, thanks so much. Good night. Good night. <laughs>